Good morning, family. Um, you know, I follow a lot of preachers on social media and things like that. They often put sermon excerpts out and um, ideas and things are uh, just have Bible studies online that I, I participate in. And uh, it was surprising to note uh, how many of them are talking about the tradition of uh, well, I told Dave about this earlier, but uh, the tradition of telling mothers on Mother's Day what a wonderful thing they are, how 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 amazing they are, and they're angels from heaven and all of this stuff. And then we get to fathers, and it's, uh, you guys need to step up. You guys need to discipline your children. You guys... <laughs> um, so I, in an attempt to uh, be different, because, you know, what am I if not that, uh, I am going to attempt to speak to everyone else. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going to try to do so quick enough that you guys can get home and grill for lunch uh, because, you know, it's Father's Day and that's what you're supposed to do. I don't know. Bailey told me I couldn't grill today, and now I've spent the morning questioning my purpose in life. Um, I want to read some statistics to you because we live in a world that um, where single mother households are not an uncommon thing, and it's it's gotten to the point where it's very easy. For society to say, oh, look at these examples. See, fathers, men aren't necessary. But I want to read some statistics to you. This comes from um, America First Policies, the one that that uh, um, that actually wrote a paper on this and put it out. But it was it's been confirmed by four different independent studies. Um, children raised in fatherless households are between. 15 and 20 times more likely to be incarcerated than those raised in dual parent households. State run institutions state that 70% of juveniles in state run facilities come from in state run facilities come from single parent homes. Children without fathers are 279% more likely to carry guns and deal drugs than those with fathers. 71% of high school dropouts come from fatherless homes. And 90% of homeless and runaway children come from fatherless homes. So we can point at homes without fathers and say that they're not necessary. But when we look at the end results of those homes, we find that the opposite is the case. I find it oddly convicting and... Um, almost burdensome at the same time that God chooses to relate to us as a father. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says, And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Psalms 103 verse 13 says, As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. For he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. I think that the hardest thing, uh, at least for my wife in our household, is to see me discipline our daughter. You know, we're very different people, right? I'm heavy-handed because, you know, that's how fathers are supposed to be, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> and, and she's a lot lighter to the touch. The, the other part is, and we've talked about this, uh, her and I, that we have very different views on what is going on in the moment. See, she, she thinks about what Eden is doing and where she is and who she is right now. I'm thinking about who she is in 16 years based on what I'm looking at. Now, both things are necessary. I'm not saying they're, one is better than the other. They're necessary. But my point is, is if she's throwing a fit and having, uh, having tantrum issues, 
my wife's goal is to figure out how do we end this behavior. My main concern is if I don't put a stop to this, what is she going to turn into in 16 years when I can't put a stop to it anymore? Now, is one more necessary than the others? Absolutely not. If all you're ever concerned with is what they are when they're 18, then you miss what they are right now. Right? I need that extra perspective to remind me that she's here right now. I'm not... I'm not coding a child on a computer and then printing it when I'm done, right? But I think, that, I think that when we look at how God interacts with us and how God has interacted with humanity, we see a, a, a pretty cool picture of why he relates to us as a father figure, right? Because all throughout the Old Testament, he is constantly uh, concerned with the end game. He's constantly concerned with where are you going to end up in 20 years, in 200 years, in 2,000 years. It's not to say he's not concerned with what your behavior is right now, but when you look back at, at um, when he gives the law to Israel, what is, his, what is his reasoning? Why do they have to follow these laws? Because you must be holy. Because I am holy. You're to show the other nations what it means to be my people. He's not telling them to behave right now for the sake of behaving right now or to make me happy. He's saying you need to, you need to be a people that other people are going to look to and understand who I am. Now, if, if you're familiar with the story uh, of the prodigal son, um, if you're not, it's in Luke chapter 15. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole story this morning, but uh, essentially, if you go to Luke 15, you have this story from Jesus about the prodigal son. The idea is um, a man has two sons. Uh, one of His younger son comes to him and says, uh, I would like my inheritance early. Give me my share uh, so that I can go and live life. And so the father does so, and the child goes off, and he, and he goes into the city and uh, basically squanders his money doing all kinds of sinful, horrible things, and ends up in a position where he's stuck eating the feed that he's giving to another man's hogs. So the story is that the, the man comes back to his father, his, this man comes back to his father and uh, is very contrite. And in, in verse 20, it says, He rose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best rope and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this is my son who was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found and they began to celebrate. I want to point out to me what stood out, what stands out in that story is the son going, I am no longer worthy to be your son. And the father doesn't even respond to it. He just looks at the servant and says, my son's here. And to me, that was, that was kind of a powerful point in the story. Basically, this father, it doesn't matter if you think that you're qualified to be my son. It doesn't matter if you think I should call you my son. Because from a father's perspective, you're my son. What you decide doesn't matter on this. And in fact, uh, for, for most of us who ha are or have been or will be fathers, you'll understand this perspective. Because generally, it doesn't matter what you think on anything when you're my child. I'm your father. That's the end of it. Right? We're very, we tend to be very authoritative in comparison to mothers sometimes. But my point is that... When we, when we have children, I think that 
that God relates to us as a father because it's, it's very reflective of what it means to be a father. We're not always right. Uh, kids, close your ears. Don't listen to this. But we're not always right, right? We make mistakes. We mess up. We make the wrong decisions. Sometimes we don't have the answers. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I have never actually met a single man who was a father who truly did not care about the fact that he was a father. Even the ones we know as deadbeats, right? The guys who don't get involved, who don't do their part, who aren't responsible. The ones who haven't seen their kids in 20 years will still tell you that they're a father. They still talk about their kids. I, I, I did time with guys who had not talked to their kids in longer than I've been walking the earth. Now, did they do it right? No, they didn't. If, you, if your kid isn't talking to you for 40 years, there was something that went wrong somewhere, okay? I'm not passing judgment on, on who was wrong in the city, but something went wrong. All right. But what I find interesting is no matter what, they always still talk about them as their kid. See, for us fathers, we, we never stop being fathers, even with even if the world decides that we no longer are. I've met countless men who have no custody or, or no ability to see their children. And you know what? They will still tell you, I am a father. They will never see their kid again. They still define themselves by that role. People who don't even know God. For men, that is the biggest, most defining role any of us could ever have. There is no label, no description that you can give me that will be bigger in my mind than the fact that I'm a father. It doesn't matter how high I climb on a corporate ladder. It doesn't matter how, how many jobs or roles I serve in the church or in any other job. I, I am, my being a father is the single most defining thing to me. And I think for most men it's that way. No matter how wrong some of us may get it, that's, that's just how it is for us. We have to get to a place where we appreciate the fathers in our lives. I mean, truly appreciate that. How many of you go to your dad when you have something that you need or you don't have the answers or you need something fixed. How many of you still call dad? I know there's probably fewer of you in this group than in many, many of you guys no longer have fathers with you. And I'm sorry to hear that, but I think that you can still identify with the point that I'm, I'm going to make. The fact is, even for guys, that tends to be our response, right? If I don't know what I'm doing, I'm not even, most, uh, most, most guys won't even call a professional before calling their dad. Even when they know their dad knows nothing about it. Right? Your dad doesn't, has never done a single bit of car work in his life. You're still going to call him before you call a mechanic. Because that's dad. That's what our job is. That's how most people grow up. Dad has the answers. My daughter is convinced that I can fix anything. I'm not even good at fixing things. My, my daughter is singularly convinced that I am the strongest man she knows. I'm not even the strongest man in this room. You can't convince her of that. I've even told her there are people stronger than me. She just assumed I was lying. <laughs> That never goes away. At least it shouldn't. And when it does, it something went wrong. And that's easy for some of us to look at 
what I've said, real world examples of how we relate to our fathers on earth. How do you relate to your father in heaven? Do you still react the same way? Do you call him before the mechanic? Do you call him before the therapist? Do you call him before you call the preacher? Because let me tell you, sometimes people ask some questions. I'm like, you could have spent five minutes in prayer and, and, and three minutes in scripture and gotten the answer to this. I'm happy to answer questions, especially when it comes to godly questions, but was I your first call? Because I shouldn't be. Why is it? Why do you think that is? That so often in our lives, even though we have an example of that relationship with earthly fathers, why do you think it is that God tends to be our last call? For me, fatherhood was, uh, it, it was very confusing when I, when, when I first heard that Bailey was pregnant because I've wanted to be a dad my whole life. Like at, at an age where all these kids are deciding between being a policeman or a firefighter, I wanted to be a dad. But at the same time, how do you do a job you've never been trained how to do? This is a, a role I never get a break from. There's no clock out. There's no vacation days, no PTO. And not one person has ever actually taken the time to teach me how to do the job. Our, uh, our preacher... Um, this is obviously before I became our preacher, but uh, <laughs> when Bailey and I were first uh, going through marriage counseling, it became a pretty big topic. And our preacher at the time, he told me, I can't tell you how many times, just over and over and over again, um, even though I never actually brought it up. An earthly father is never a replacement. It is never a good substitute for a heavenly one. But the heavenly father can teach you how to be an earthly one. Although you may never have had somebody teach you how to be a dad, you have your example, 66 books of examples. Thousands of years of examples. I'm not going to take the time to try to focus on one kind of father or another. The, those of you that see your kids, those of you who don't, those of you who are single fathers, those of you, it doesn't matter. Ultimately, it doesn't really matter what life circumstances is given you. Right? You're a father. And that's all there is. Just like God is God, and that's all there is. It didn't matter what his people did. It didn't matter what they chose. God was just God. That's who he was. He was never going to stop being God. He was never going to stop being their father. He was never going to stop loving them. He was never going to stop caring about them. And he was never going to stop telling them what to do. As a father, we have the same responsibility, whether you appreciate that about our role or not. I'm going to love you no matter what you do. I'm going to care about you no matter what you do. And I'm going to tell you what to do no matter what you do. There is a ton of scripture that I could have gone to and said, oh, this mentions father. Let's read this. This mentions... 1,200 times, and I stopped counting. Because I tried to Google it, and I couldn't get the same answer twice, so I had to actually start looking. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. 
if you're not a father, it would it's it's probably not as easy for you to understand this verse. For those of us that have filled that role, my disciplining my child, my correcting her is my greatest expression of love. I don't know how to express it bigger than that. Because if I don't love you, I don't really care who you are 15 years from now. That's just a simple fact. If I don't care about you, you go do whatever you want. I'm not concerned with what kind of person you are as long as it doesn't affect me. My correction is about wanting my daughter to be a good person because I know that being a good person will help life be good to her. God is the exact same way. It can be there. There is so often the world gets this so wrong and they look at Christianity and they look at the Bible and they're like, oh, it's so restrictive. Here's a rule and here's a rule and here's a rule. And it tells us who we should be and how we should think and how we should act. And we don't want all these rules. But if if God didn't care about you, he wouldn't concern himself with it. He's telling you who to be. <laughs> His telling you how to be is his biggest expression of love. He's concerned with life being good to you. But he also knows, he also knows that in order for you to experience goodness, in order for you to have good things, in order for you to have a life abundantly, you must be good. We cannot be a people that hate the reproof or the correction of our fathers, either the heavenly ones or the earthly ones. So with that, I want to end by saying, Thank you to everyone, uh, all of you men who have filled that role in the past or in the future. I want to say thank you to all of you men who have in some way filled at least part of that role in my life. And I hope that all of you, whether you're man, woman, child, father, parent, whatever, will take this to heart and recognize that fathers are not disposable. They're not something that can be done away with and think that the world would be okay. There is a profound reason that God relates to us as a father. And if fathers didn't matter, he wouldn't spend so much time telling us about the relationship between father and children. So happy Father's Day. I hope that for the fathers that are here that you experience a day that blesses you, that makes you feel seen and appreciated. I hope that your children will obey you at least this one day a year. And I hope that you'll forgive yourself of all the times that we so often mess up. With that, we'll close with the same offer we do every Sunday, every time we gather together. If you have any needs this morning, whether it's um, reconciliation to God through baptism, whether it's confession or a request for prayers, whatever your needs are this morning, we ask that you bring them forward and make them known so we can help you see them met as we stand and sing.